Revelation chapter number four. Now, uh, keep your Bible next to you because we're going to be going to a lot of scripture today. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, Isaac, if you'll do me a favor, I've got some handouts there um, on that front pew. If you'll give everybody one of those, I've got enough for everybody. And uh, just kind of something to keep in your Bible. Maybe hang on your fridge a little bit because it's a good reminder for us uh, because we're going to be looking at those crowns tonight. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in those crowns. Amen. I'm interested in the crowns that I'm going to receive. And then I'm even more interested in the fact that all those crowns that I receive and earn, I get to cast at the feet of Jesus. I'm looking forward to that. All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 4. If you found your place and you're able to, would you stand with me? We'll read verses 10 and 11 here. Verse 10 says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Father, we do love you. You've been good. Thank you for the good day today. Lord, I want to pray that you'll just bless uh, our time around the Word of God. And Lord, I know that uh, we, we ask that uh, you would come and commune with us and, and uh, fellowship with us and allow us to worship you uh, tonight. Lord, uh, we certainly want that tonight. And Lord, I, I know that uh, you're God. And uh, you're in all places at all times. So no matter where the church is, Lord, I pray, God, that uh, every local church uh, will stand uh, and give you honor and glory on today. Lord, I do want to pray for Pastor Bird, Lord. And I, I know that um, uh, he probably is not going to get a lot of sleep tonight. Uh, some because of the pain, some because of uh, being anxious about uh, the doctor's appointment tomorrow. Uh, Lord, uh, my prayer this, this evening is very simple, uh, that you would reveal everything that needs to be revealed. And Lord, you would give wisdom to everyone that would make a decision uh, on uh, the treatment and that you would give skill to everyone. Uh, that uh, will look at his records, uh, interpret uh, every scan, uh, and uh, even everyone that puts their hands upon his leg, Lord, I pray, God, that you'll give them all great skill. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll just uh, bless uh, in all things, give grace and comfort, not just to Brother Willie, uh, but to Miss Pat as well. Lord, I pray, God, that you would, uh, Lord, uh, I know it's a serious thing, Lord, just uh, I pray that uh, you'll give them confidence and peace. We'll be careful to thank you in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, this evening, we're going to set some things in perspective before we get into uh, verses 10 and 11, uh, but uh, uh, I want us to understand and get into our heads that the next event that we are looking for is the rapture of the saints. Uh, we've already looked at this in depth, and uh, so there's no need to cover this again. But in case you weren't here and you're taking note, uh, uh, I want you to compare Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 uh, with 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, almost the entire chapter there. Uh, and then go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, and you will see this same event uh, uh, mentioned uh, and described in three different places in the Bible. Uh, and you know, a lot of times when uh, we look at uh, the end times, and a lot of times when we look at uh, these things, uh, we say, well, we're going to be raptured out. Chapter 4, verse number 1, the church is gone, the saints of God are gone, uh, and everything that happens uh, from there on out until Jesus, uh, we return with Jesus later on, 
Uh, all of that's going to be for everything else. And so I ain't got to worry about anything else. And, and a lot of times uh, uh, as preachers, we think that, but there is another event that we're going to be involved in. It's just not going to be here uh, on the earth. And that event is the judgment seat uh, of Christ. Uh, I want you to hold your place here and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, the Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, um, and uh, we're going to... Uh, look at verses 10 uh, or verses 11 through 15 here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to get there, I promise you. Verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So uh, again, we see three different references uh, uh, to the judgment seat of Christ, okay? And, uh, and this is going to come up again uh, in the Revelation as well. But um, uh, we have seen multiple places where the judgment seat of Christ is going to uh, happen. And uh, that is going to be one of those, you know, somber moments, to be honest with you. Um, you just don't, uh, you really don't know what to expect. You know, it's like going to the doctor, you know. Uh, you, you, you have no idea what the doctor is going to say. Uh, you, uh, some people are stressful about taking tests at school. You study, you study, you study, you're prepared, uh, and then you go on in there and you're like, Oh, I hope I do good. Because you've got a, a, a certain amount of stress that comes with that. And I know that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a little bit of anxiety there because it becomes real. This is real world now. This is not something we read in the Bible. This is something that we are going to experience. And we see here that we're going to receive reward or lose reward. We're going to see that. Uh, our work is going to be tried uh, by fire. And if it's wood, hay, stubble, it's going to be burnt up. And, you know, what you think that you've gained, that's gone. That's up in smoke. And you've done it for the wrong reason, or, or perhaps you, you think you've done it for Jesus and you kind of did it for you, uh, you know, uh, something about wood, hay, stubble. When it burns, it's gone. It's kind of like those tumbleweeds, you know. You put a little looking at Laura. We had a discussion today about tumbleweeds uh, around here. And for those of you that are watching online, that maybe you are not from New Mexico or Arizona uh, or California. Something about tumbleweeds. Tumbleweeds, you light them things up and they burn. And they burn fast, and they burn hot, and then they're gone. You, they don't even leave ash. I mean, they're just gone just like that. And you know, wood, hay, stubble, 
I'm, I'm kind of getting the idea that that is what's going to happen. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is reserved only for believers. The unbelievers, they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment. That is found in Revelation chapter number 20. But here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, uh, I want you to notice that everything that is built is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. There's a foundation of Jesus Christ there. Uh, a lost person does not have that foundation. Uh, only saved people have the foundation of Jesus Christ. That's the, that is our foundation. That's what we are building on, amen. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, my mind just went to Matthew chapter number 7 where the wise man built his house upon a rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Well, that rock is Jesus, amen. That foundation that we're looking at here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, uh, that's Jesus. Uh, do you know who built on the foundation uh, of Jesus? Christians uh, do that. And what we build upon this foundation is going to be tried. And we're going to receive rewards according to what works abide. Now, uh, I want us to go back to Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now last week we looked at these four and twenty elders and determined that they represent the saints of God. Uh, we do that because they're crowned. And we know that they have already stood before the judgment seat of Christ and have received their rewards because guess what? They're wearing those crowns there. And then in verse 10 and verse number 11, we see what they do with the crowns uh, that they won. And by the way, uh, it's not they, because if you're here today and you're saved, you're part of the four and twenty elders. Amen? You're going to stand with your crowns. And, and in verse 10 and 11, we saw exactly what they did. They cast them before the throne at the feet of Jesus. That's what they did. You know, an uh, interesting thing um, about, about possessions or things we earn we don't like to let go of those things, you know, because I earned that. I ain't giving that up. And we all have things like that. You know, and, you know, just some of the craziest things uh, we take pride in. Um, I, there's not a whole lot. Uh, all of those things that I got, uh, they're in disarray and they're in a cabinet in my garage uh, all the way on the top. It's just crazy. I got all kinds of stupid stuff up there. And, uh, you know, when I first got them, I hung them on the wall the whole nine yards. You know, and it, it just seems like a lifetime ago. And, uh, you know, some of those things, you know, man, I used to value those things. I don't really value them that much. You know, somewhere up there, I got a John Levito Award, and, and most of you probably don't even know what a John Levito Award is. That's an Air Force Award. Um, but I've got one of those. I've got all kinds of certificates for all kinds of stupid stuff. And you know, the, the thing that I value the most that is up there in that cabinet. And uh, most of you remember Dan and Maya came. Uh, Dan was the one that, he was my sponsor on the base. He's the one that uh, invited me to church and invested his energy so that I would be saved. Uh, he was the one that I learned uh, under. He was my mentor there in the Air Force learning those airplanes. And you got to understand, uh, uh, I was not like Brother Bernard or Brother Terry. Um, I didn't know tools. I didn't know that stuff. I mean, um, and, and I know Brother Bernard's uh, family, his uncle, is, was your dad. Your dad was a painter, but uh, he had tools too. Uh, but he grew up, he learned all that stuff at home. 
I didn't learn any of that stuff. My dad's tools, he fitted in a little green tackle box for fishing, about that big. And he didn't know what to do with them. He had no idea. In fact, um, I'm not exaggerating. This is the truth. When me and Casey saw Dad grab that little green tackle box with his five or six tools in there and start walking towards the car, we found a way to be out of whistling range, out of yelling range, and certainly out of range of him throwing those tools. Because whatever he did, he was going to break. That's just the way that it was. So when I got into the Air Force, uh, I knew what a wrench was. Uh, one had been thrown at me before, okay? I knew what a screwdriver was. Uh, one had been thrown at, in my direction before. Uh, but other than that, I didn't know anything. And so uh, I get out of tech school. Uh, I go to the flight line, and, and uh, Danny uh, is trying to teach me things. He says, uh, hand me a socket. I said, great, uh, what's a socket? And he's thinking, how did the Air Force, in their wisdom, put you in this career field? And uh, I, I mean, I, I had no clue. And uh, I just applied myself, and I just went to town on it, and I said, you know what? Uh, I, I'm not going to be a dummy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do good, and I'm, I'm going to apply myself the best I can. And I did that, and, and by the time that I left that duty assignment seven years later, uh, uh, that John Levito war didn't mean anything to me. None of that stuff meant anything to me, but uh, my shop made me a plaque. They did it themselves. And they get, it's a little plastic box. You got some rocks in there. And got it mounted on that board. And there's a, uh, the saying on that is, uh, Sergeant Sin came to us as a box of rocks, but he left the greatest electrician or the best electrician or something. That meant something to me. That meant something to me. But you know, we all have something like that. But we don't, our goal is not to get glory to ourselves. It's to give glory to Jesus. And to be honest with you, the thing that I enjoyed the most out of being in the Air Force is the people I was able to reach on that flight line. The impact I was able to do. And, and uh, I know that... Uh, I'm going to stand before the judgment seat one day and the Lord's going to say, hey, you reach that, per you reach that person. Man, you was faithful and all of that. And, and that's going to be something I'm going to be proud of. But you know what? I'm just going to give God the honor and I'm going to give God the glory uh, in all of that. And uh, this evening, uh, we're going to look at some of these crowns that we'll win. And um, I, I want to uh, look at them, uh, and I want to say briefly, but it ain't going to be briefly. Uh, but the Bible speaks of five crowns that will be given at the judgment seat of Christ. And you can see them on your handout. It's the incorruptible crown, the crown of life, the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, and the crown of rejoicing. And uh, uh, the first crown I want to look at is the incorruptible crown. Uh, turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, we'll begin reading in verse 23. Verse 23 says, For this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may attain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, 
lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Uh, the incorruptible crown is also called the victor's crown, and it is for those uh, that have gotten the mastery uh, over the old man. Uh, the old man is the old nature that still wars with the new creature inside. And the old man, he desires to do the things that we used to do. And uh, anytime, uh, most of you in here, probably all of you in here are saved. And you understand the battle that goes on. Uh, what I used to do uh, as a lost man, uh, my the reason you did that is because the flesh wanted you to do that. The flesh desired that. And you get saved and uh, God makes you a new creature and uh, all of those things happen and your life changes. Uh, but that, that old nature keeps wanting to sneak in. And that's why Paul says, I, I, I keep under my body and I put it under subjection and, and you know, uh, I die daily. Things like that, he has said, because... There is a war that goes on between uh, that new nature we have and the old nature uh, that wants control uh, over our lives again. Uh, I want you to turn to uh, Ephesians chapter number 4. Beginning in verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God to the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away a lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed uh, out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be a kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, uh, this particular crown here is given to everyone that has won victory over the flesh. Now, make no mistake about this. You're going to battle the old man and the old nature for the rest of your life. You're going to do that. Uh, Romans chapter number 7, uh, Paul describes uh, himself. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. He says, man, the good that I would, I do not. And the, the, uh, the evil that I would not, that I do. He, I, I mean, he just went on. And, and we're talking about the Apostle Paul, okay? We're talking about Paul. And um, now, if anybody in this building, me included, thinks that uh, we got it better than Paul, and we're better than Paul. You better hit the altar. Paul is a man that God used in a great, great, great way. And yet he himself battled this. 
often. And we're going to battle it the rest of our life. But there's a reward or a crown for those who learn to get the victory over the old man. Will we win every time? No, we're not going to win every time. We're human. But the victor will receive an incorruptible crown. The second crown is the crown of life or the martyr's crown. Turn with me to the Revelation chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. And we've covered this recently here. Verse 8 says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, we've already covered the church at Smyrna. And you'll remember Smyrna was the persecuted uh, church. They suffered, they were cast into prison, and even some died for their faith. Uh, but because of their faithfulness, they were going to receive crowns. The crown of life. The crown of life is also mentioned in James chapter 1 and verse 12. And uh, this is going to be your verse, by the way, for your outline. James chapter 1 and verse 12. We'll turn there so that you can uh, get a head start on it, maybe. James writes in verse 12 of chapter 1, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So you'll see that this crown is promised to those that endure temptation and trials. The next crown is the crown of glory, or as some refer to it as the elder's crown. Uh, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. First four verses here. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither be ye lords over God's heritage, but being in samples unto the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. This particular crown is reserved for pastors who are faithful to God's calling on their life. It is rewarded for them. And not, not every pastor is going to get this crown, okay? Not every missionary is going to get this crown. You, this is not participation trophy, okay? Um, no, 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 no. Uh, this crown is given uh, to those that have been faithful to the calling of God on their life, those that willingly feed the flock of God. Uh, for uh, him that uh, will willingly take the oversight of the flock or, and, and he who is the ensample to the flock. And uh, that, those are uh, things that uh, we find absent nowadays uh, in our pulpits all the time. Uh, we're to feed the flock of God. Uh, now, uh, watch you understand something, and, and a lot of people don't understand this. Um, uh, if you've pastored any length of time, uh, Lord willing, you've got a pretty good grasp on this. Uh, but uh, when it says feed the flock of God, uh, you don't choose the menu, okay? 
A lot of people think that the pastor's up there. Well, you know, I, let me see. Uh, Juanita's right there. I ain't had, I ain't jumped all over Juanita in a little while. So let me see. I'm going to get on Juanita. Oh, yeah, this will be good. This will be good for Juanita. Boom, boom, boom. Man, I'm going to, uh, I am going to plow right down her road this time. And, you know, and, and I'm just feeding the flock of God. No, 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 no. You're not the mean. You're the waiter. That's what you are. All you're doing is delivering. Uh, it's not your flock. That's the flock that God has entrusted you with. And I know that um, I'm kind of preaching outside of... Um, uh, there's not a whole lot of pastors in here is what I'm trying to say. But... Um, you know, we've got to feed the flock of God. And we feed what God wants us to feed them. You know, pastors, a lot of times they like to feed everybody dessert for every meal. But, and there's times God wants you to feed dessert to his flock. But God there's times he wants you to serve liver. You say, I don't like liver. Well, I'm just a waiter. It's just what on the plate. Sometimes you got to feed salad. Well, I don't like salad. Salad's boring. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, that salad's got a purpose, amen. And God wants to feed you some salad, amen. And so a pastor has got to be faithful in his relationship with God to find the will of God uh, and to feed the flock of God what God wants them to be fed. But it also talks about the oversight of the flock. And that's a tough thing. That is a very, very tough thing. And and I know a lot of times uh, pastors get a bad rap on all of that. Uh, my, uh, uh, my former pastor, his first name was Lev. Okay, it's just not short for anything, just Lev. Uh, his parents named him Lev. And um, so uh, we called him pastor. We called him Brother Lev sometimes. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Terrence just met him last week. And, uh, uh, you know, people, whenever they get all upset, they say, I'm not going to be a Levite. They didn't say Levite, they said Levite. You know, uh, that's a cult over there and all that. And, you know, uh, because they didn't get their way a lot of times. Um, and a lot of pastors, uh, they think it benefits them by not taking the oversight. But yet that's the responsibility God has given them. That's the responsibility that they are going to give an account for, whether good or bad. But that is a, uh, you have to understand this. Whenever you take the oversight, whenever you take the leadership, uh, you are in a no-win situation because somebody's always angry at you. You know, and you're like, I, I'm just, I, I just want to be a lover. I don't want to be a fighter. And, and a lot of people do that. A lot of pastors will do that, and they'll step back and say, well, uh, what do y'all think we ought to do? And, and uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, you asked the wrong person. You better be on your knees and ask God. Say, God, uh, in our Sunday school class, in the men's Sunday school class, we saw where that got there. Uh, Moses goes up to the mountain. He's up there for 40 days talking with God. They know he's talking with God. They can look up at the mountain and uh, they're seeing uh, the lightning and the thunder and the clouds and all of that. Uh, when that first showed on up there and God speaks to them out of that mountain, they're afraid. And Moses goes up on that mountain. That cloud ain't gone away yet. Then Aaron's down there and says, what do y'all think we ought to do? Well, we don't know what happened to Moses. Let 
That cloud's still there. We don't know what happened to him. Uh, let's make us a golden calf. Woo. Aaron paid for that. Children of Israel paid a heavy price for that. You know, when Aaron made that choice, Moses had left him in that leadership position. Left him in that leadership position. His leadership was not, Lord, what would thou have me to do? It was, folks, what do you want me to do? That ne hey, that never works. That never works. I want you to think about this. And, uh, you know, while Isaac was teaching his Sunday school today, I was thinking about this. If he wouldn't have sinned, if Miriam wouldn't have sinned, when they crossed the Jordan River and Moses was going to die along the way, you know who would have been the leader going over there? Aaron was the right-hand man. But no, instead it was Joshua. And I'm going to tell you, Joshua took full advantage of that. Joshua was a good man. Now Joshua, man, he got a hold of God. His whole generation, man, and the generation after them, they, they served God. Uh, when he died, he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. He put it to them, and they says, as for me and my family, we've already made our choice. We're, we're serving the Lord. And they says, we too, we're going to serve God too. And the Bible says after that, that, that that generation after Joshua continued to serve God. Took the oversight. You know, that's, that's not a good, that's not a desirable position to be in because you open yourself, you've got a target on your back all the time. But a faithful man of God will willingly take the oversight. And he's going to be an example to the flock. I mean, an example. Yeah, um, um, I'm uh, thinking about Brother Archie um, and uh, the seminar yesterday. You know that whole thing, that whole reverse pyramid that he talked about yesterday was built on the foundation of Christ and the ensample of the man of God there. And if that man of God is a good example, if he'll get in there and he'll labor alongside everybody, everybody else will follow. And that pyramid begins to grow and grow and grow. You know what? That does not work if the pastor is not willing to be an example. Not willing to be an example. Um, I, uh, uh, I I never intended to be in this area that long, this long, because not a lot of pastors here. But in case some are, are listening here, um, one of the one of the things that I ran across often as an evangelist, rolling into an, a new church or or a church maybe I've been there before, and they're having problems in the in. You know, I try to stay out of everybody's business. But the pastor always, for some reason, I come in and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they just need somebody to vent on. And some of these guys I know, personal friends with. And I'm going through this, and, you know, they won't do this, they won't do that. And, you know, I have to very kindly say, you know what? You need to be a leader and lead by example. And if you lead by example, they may or may not follow you, but more than likely they will. And it'll be on them if they don't. But you can only do what you can do, what you're responsible for. You're responsible for being an example, for feeding the flock of God and taking the oversight thereof. You do that, you don't judge by result. You judge by how faithful you were to your calling. If you're faithful, there's a crown uh, of glory. 
Um, the fourth crown is the crown of righteousness. I want you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Second Timothy chapter number four, and for sake of time, I'm just going to read verse number eight, but of course, you know that this chapter, uh, Paul is ready to be offered, and the time of his departure is at hand. He's going through all of this, and he is shortly going to die. Uh, but uh, he says in verse seven, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Now, this is the crown that's given to those who love the appearance of Christ, love his appearing. Now, I'm going to throw something into your think tank that you probably have just gone right over. A uh, backslider doesn't look forward to his appearing, okay? You know, we automatically say, well, uh, every saved person looking forward to his appearing, so it's got to be talking about lost people. No, 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 no. Hold on. Not every saved person is looking forward to his appearing, and, and the backslider certainly doesn't look forward to that because uh, he knows that that appearance means that the judgment seat is next, and a backslider don't want to be there in front of Jesus uh, in a backslidden condition. And uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you, you may be in a backslidden condition and, and uh, you're thinking, man, if Jesus comes back right now, the uh, next thing I'm going to do is see him face to face. I'm in this condition. Man, I ain't looking forward to that. I ain't looking forward to that. And you shouldn't. You shouldn't. So uh, the crown of righteousness is for those that love his appearing. I, I don't know about you. But I'm like John, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We say that so that we'll get out of this old wicked world. But we don't think that we're going to stand before Jesus and give an account of our lives. When we start thinking about that, so, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Jesus, uh, give me a few years. There's a far country over there that I need to go to. And I need to waste my living or a substance with righteous living. Hey, just let me sow my wild oats a little bit. You don't, you're, not, you, you're not looking for his appearing. Let me give you the last one here. The last crown is the crown of rejoicing, or as some refer to it as the soul winner's crown. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. Paul writes to this church, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Apostle Paul is writing to a church that he started. He's writing to a church that are filled with people that he is one to Jesus personally. And he says, I don't glory in this building or this local church. For you guys individually, you're my joy. I remember, I remember meeting you at the marketplace. And I remember telling you about Jesus. I remember your first reaction. But you became a Christian. I remember you meeting you on the road. 
And I told you about Jesus and, and that uh, uh, Jesus uh, was resurrected after three days and you called me a crazy person and you told me to leave you alone and then I saw you the next day and you began to think about it and, and ask some more questions and then uh, I took some time and, and won you to Jesus, amen. And he's looking throughout this congregation uh, in his mind as he's re writing this letter and he says, uh, you know what, I'm looking at all you people and, and uh, seeing what God's done in your life and see how, how the Lord has rescued you from uh, hell and, and, and uh, seeing what you have become. He said, you're my crown, uh, you're my joy, uh, you're the, the reason that I rejoice uh, here. And uh, uh, he, he's rejoicing because he knows he's going to see them in the Lord's presence when he comes. So uh, the, that's the soul winner's crown. You know, uh, somebody doesn't win somebody, Jesus don't get that crown. You know, again, it's not a participation trophy. It's an achievement. You won somebody to Jesus or you, you made the effort to win somebody to Jesus. You get that crown. So now we know how we're going to win these crowns. We know what they represent, but I want to leave you with this. These crowns are not for our glory. They're for His glory. Because let me remind you that in Revelation chapter 4, verse 10, in our text, those crowns will be cast at the Lord's feet before the throne. And thus the greater reward, the greater capacity we have to bring glory to Him. You say, well, I'm just going to get rid of it anyways. Hey, you win more, and you win more, and you win more. The more you win, that means the more you get to cast. And the more you get to cast, the more glory that you give to Jesus. And that's what it's all about. It's about Jesus, isn't it? It ain't about, it's not about the four and twenty elders. Listen, I don't see anywhere in the Bible to where a saved man, woman, boy, or girl is going to be walking through heaven uh, looking like a Boy Scout with bear badges on and talking about all the crowns uh, that they've won during their lifetime. No! Those crowns are going to be cast at the feet of Jesus. And he's the one that's going to get the glory. And that's what our motivation needs to be. I want to bring glory to Jesus. I want to bring glory to Jesus. I don't care about me. And you ought not to care about you. But you better care about Jesus. Am I bringing glory to Jesus? And that brings me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. You don't need to turn there. The Bible says, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're bought with a price. And now we're on a lifetime mission. I want to bring glory to Jesus in my body and in my spirit. I want us to consider rapture happened right now. Judgment seat happened right now. How much glory are we going to give to Jesus? Say, uh, and I don't know, I'm kind of getting the idea in the revelation that this is not going to be done behind closed doors. You know, well, man, I got one crown. And I'm going to cast it at his feet and walk out the door and the next guy comes in. No, 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 no. It's before the throne. Well, no, I, I don't know about you. But I want to bring a lot of glory to Jesus. And we can only do that here on this earth. So... 
You think about you. Let me think about me. And let me ask myself, and you ask yourself, what am I doing for Jesus while I'm living on this earth? And maybe I should do more. Maybe is not a really good word. Definitely, we should do more. Father, we do love you. Thank you. Would you bless? Have your will and way. Lord, I really do look forward.